right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, tonight's workshop, fact or myth, this, this comment uh, came across because there's a, there's a lot of common understandings that, you know, that people think and, you know, we, we come across questions all the time with dietary stuff, with exercise, you know, with rules that a lot of people still think are true, even in the natural community and, and you know, obviously people that are completely foreign to any of this stuff, they're going to have a lot of these things they just think are common sense, you know, when in reality they're, they're missed. So we're going to go through... Uh, there, there's something like 45 slides or something like that to go through, but we should be able to go through them pretty quickly. Um, some of the things are, you know, chiropractic-wise, I finish off with the chiropractic section on questions, just some of the common ones that hopefully will get us into some more of the, the deeper philosophy type stuff. Um, so, of course, that's going to be my favorite uh, section of the night. So, really a lot of this is, like, like it says here, rewriting history, textbooks, and all the other means of continued ignorance. Ignorance doesn't mean um, deliberate ignorance is just simply not knowing you know so a lot of this stuff is perpetuated by textbooks history hearsay all these other things you know and so we just keep repeating the same the same story does everybody know this the uh, the, the little story about mom or uh, you know grandma and the ham you guys heard that some of you guys probably have but I'll repeat it anyways mm -hmm. uh, so this girl is making the Christmas ham and uh, she, you know, she's in the kitchen and, and she starts cutting the ends off the ham. And her little daughter asked her mom, why'd you cut the ends off the ham? She said, I don't know. Like, you know, that's what mom always did. So she's like, well, why? And she said, I don't know. So she gets on the phone and she calls her mom and says, mom, why do you always cut the ends off the ham? And mom says, well, I don't know. That's what grandma always did. So I just, I just figured that's the way you're supposed to do it. So she calls grandma and grandma says, it's because my pan was too small. You know, so we do the same things over and over again without thinking about it. And these kind of things are perpetual, especially in healthcare. Okay, so we're going to start with diet myths. And uh, the first one, saturated fats are bad, right? Everybody's heard this one. So we get this idea that saturated fats are bad, when in reality, there are many healthy saturated fats like coconut oil, butter, and avocado oil. So the, the reality of the saturated fats being bad, that has perpetuated in the heart community. You know, you go to cardiologists even today and they're gonna tell you, stay away from saturated fats because they're bad for you. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Let's take butter for example. Uh, butter is far, far healthier than margarine, right? A lot of people they stay away from margarine, or you know, from butter and they use margarine instead. Margarine is it's a hydrogenated oil, it's pure hydrogenated oils. It's terrible for your heart. So, you know, you got to understand it's the quality of the oil that makes a difference, not that it's saturated or unsaturated. You can even find bad quality uh, coconut oil, you know, but you just got to know where you're getting it. Make sense? So saturated, all that means is that basically the chain of fat, it's saturated with molecules. So uh, it's, it's the more degraded it is, the, the polyunsaturated fats that tend to, tend to have higher problems. Okay, you should cook with olive oil. How many people in here cook with olive oil? Okay, still got quite a few that cook with olive oil. Okay, so you know a lot of people think they're really doing good cooking with olive oil. The reality is every oil has a smoke point in which it becomes damaged and turns into trans fats. Olive oils, especially when you use lower grade olive oils, they have a very low smoke point. You know, so here's the, here's the test. As soon as you see it smoking, it's turning into trans fats. So, you know, any oil, I mean, even coconut oil can be bad for you if you get it to the point where you're like frying, you know, your Thanksgiving turkey in it, you know, and it's, and it's like smoking all over the place, then that's bad. You know, if you leave it in the pan, anybody ever go to cook eggs and then leave the coconut oil in the pan too long and then it starts, it starts heating because there's too, you know, you, you don't have that much and it's, it's just frying up in the pan everywhere. It's blasting, you know, it's crackling. Yeah. So that's, that's when the oils are going bad. So uh, ghee actually has one of the highest temperatures, uh, smoke points of any of them. Ghee is butter oils. So you, you, we have some of it next door, but I don't, I don't, we're not going to be carrying it anymore. It's really expensive. So it's like $13 for a little tiny jar this big. Uh, but coconut oil is what we use. 
but just know the smoke point is what is important. Okay, you can use some higher quality olive oils and they'll still, they'll still have relatively high smoke points, but you gotta watch for that. What the kind of reality is there is you don't really wanna fry anything, right? You wanna keep stuff as, as uncooked as possible unless you're talking about meat. Uh, fat makes you fat. How many people have heard that? How many people have been on, in the past, been on low fat diets, right? Everybody probably has been on a low fat diet at one point. The reality is fat does not make you fat. It's the inability to burn fat that makes you fat, right? So it's why is your body not burning the fat that's going in? In some cases, that comes down to the fat that you're consuming. For example, pig fat. Pig fat is not really digestible by the human body. Okay, so it does not effectively digest. Uh, if we, we can talk about the unsaturated fats, um, you know, the, the trans fats, things like that, your body doesn't effectively get rid of them. But it's not actually consuming fat that makes you fat. In fact, fat, good fats in your diet actually help your body to burn fat. Why? Because when you eat good fats, it keeps your body in that process of digesting fats. So if you stop eating fats, not only does your brain and spinal cord suffer because they're made of fat, but your body now loses that metabolic ability to burn fats, and so it tends to stack on easier. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, there's another one. Uh, meat is bad. This one is gaining in popularity now. Mm -hmm. Meat is bad. You should not eat meat. You know, especially you shouldn't eat red meat. You know, it's funny though. People that say they don't eat red meat, they're eating Tyson chicken. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You know, so they, they skip red meat, like red meat's the devil. You can't have that, but they're eating chickens that their legs break underneath them because they're so large, cool. right? I mean, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So this, this idea that meat is bad is because the meat that has been studied has been consistently studied on corn-fed beef, for example. So humans are created to eat and digest meat. That is inarguable. You cannot argue with that from a physiological standpoint. Our digestive tract is built for it. You've got these things called canines that are built for it, okay? From an anatomy standpoint, we are built for it. It's the variety and the health of the meat that makes the difference as to what we're supposed to eat and what we're not supposed to eat. Make sense? Okay, next one, only pasteurized dairy is safe to consume, right? Ever, anybody ever stay, stay away from, or, or I mean, Honestly, have you ever had the opportunity to, to consume raw milk and you had that thought in your mind, hmm, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's safe. Like, you really think you're going to be poisoned if you do? This idea has been really perpetuated strong that if you eat raw milk, consume raw milk products, that you're going to get sick. But have you noticed a lot of stores now, they carry raw cheese? You know, and, and it's not really a big problem. Um, even raw dairy has now been shown in some research that the, the, the fresh raw dairy actually has less bacteria in it than pasteurized milk. Why do you think that is? It's real simple because the raw milk has immune factors in it. It has antibodies in it that are, that are supposed to do exactly that, keep the milk fresh while the baby is consuming it. But see, does a baby cow get its milk pumped and put into a carton and then given to it <laughs> five days later. No. no, it's short term, right? It's supposed to go directly from the cow directly into the baby cow. So it's not supposed to go through this, you know, through this packaging and processing and shipped across the country or around the world and all this other kind of stuff. So, uh, so the pasteurization process kills all those immune factors and then it basically allows bacteria to grow if they're in that culture. The idea with pasteurization is contain it so that no bacteria can get in and then flash kill all the bacteria, but it doesn't always work, okay? Uh, more enzyme, the, uh, let's see, it often has less bacteria than pasteurized, more enzymes and does not cause leaky gut. Leaky gut is caused by the homogenation process. Basically, it takes these giant milk proteins and through homogenation, it breaks them down into tiny clumps that now get into your intestinal tract, leak through your intestinal wall, get into your bloodstream, and then what do they do in the bloodstream? They damage your arteries, and then what, do you, what does your body produce to fix that damage? Cholesterol. 
That's why people's cholesterol is high, because of leaky gut syndrome. So the health of the cows ultimately is really what matters. That's always the big factor. Okay? On that note, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Would it bother you guys if I just finished a workshop like this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Doesn't come out of a mustache as well. <laughs> All right. So uh, organic farming is too fickle to sustain population. Who's heard that? I, I was in the store, and uh, and a lady was, you know, I said something about GMOs, and the lady's like, she's like, you know, my son is a farmer, and if we did not have genetically modified crops, the world would starve. I mean, straight face. I said, no, that's not true. She's like, no, yes, it is. And I said, no. It's not. Yes, it is. I said, all right, here's my card. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to argue it anymore. But think about, okay, first of all, think about how ridiculous an idea that is. I mean, where, where would we even get that idea that organic farming is too fickle to sustain population? Wait a minute. What have we done for all of human history? Obviously, it's done okay. All right. It, it, you know, now clearly we're having problems feeding people in third world countries. Is that because they don't have GMOs? No, it's because they can't grow stuff in dirt and sand. We need so so. Here's the idea: if we put half the money and effort into organic farming techniques, research, and education to those populations, as we do into protecting the profits of Monsanto and these other big companies, then the world would overflow with food. We would have absolutely no problem feeding the world. You go over and you see projects that are happening in, in Africa right now where they're teaching farming techniques to people and they're doing just fine. They're starting to produce and they're loving it. They're, they're, they enjoy making their own food. So the idea is just ridiculous. We could not feed the world without GMOs. This is the other half of that little uh, scenario, right? So. No matter how you look at it, this is laughable and has never been proven. Plain and simple. If you hear anybody say this, say, how do you figure? Like seriously, how do you figure? How, how can you even say that? We have, how many things do we produce in the world that are GMO anyways? Cotton, soybeans, corn. Are you saying the entire world survives off of corn? I mean, at least the United States does, right? Mm -hmm. But the rest of the world doesn't live off of corn. I mean, more people live off of rice than they do corn, mm -hmm. but rice isn't genetically modified. So how can you how can you prove that statement? It's not provable. There's no basis for this whatsoever. Both costs and yields. So the cost of producing GMO crops and the actual yields, the complete opposite of what they say, have failed in studies in actual practice around the world. So they they've done studies, for example, in India with cotton crops where they've looked at the, the, the places that have kept the natural cotton and the, the places that have used the, the GMO cotton and the GMO farmers, they have a huge problem over there because GMO uh, cotton farmers who have spent their entire family's wealth and, you know, and spent their, you know, basically what their families have protected for generations, they've switched over to the GMO crops, lost everything and they're all, they're committing suicide left and right. This is, I mean, you can look this up. They're committing suicide because they're, they're losing everything over there. So it's failed again and again and again. It, it just, it doesn't hold water any way you look at it. There's plenty of information. This is just basically what is fed to farmers here in the United States to get them to purchase the GMO corn and everything else. It's going to die next season and they got to buy it again. You know, it doesn't cost that much to save seed. All right, next, uh, chemicals and food, et cetera, are a modern miracle, right? You know, because we can package foods, we can store them, we can preserve them. You know, you, you can keep it on the shelf for three years and nothing's going to be wrong with it. You know, you can open it and have a fresh meal, Chef, Chef Boyardee, right? Uh, this is a myth. Food is supposed to rot. If it doesn't, there is something wrong. There's something wrong with a piece of bread, a loaf of bread that can sit on the counter not covered and it turns into a brick before bacteria will attack it. There's something wrong with that. Have you, has anybody seen the, the cheeseburger 
video on YouTube where the guy, like, he lost a cheeseburger in his pocket of a coat and didn't find it for like 16 years and he pulled it out and it looked exactly the same and it still even smelled exactly like the cheeseburger. I mean, it, like, it did not change at all. So they started like a whole project on it. Uh, back, you know, French fries, you can put them on the, on the ground for months and months and months and months on end. They will look exactly the same yellow as they did when you put them there. Why are white potatoes yellow in this? When you make french fries out of them? How does that happen? Curiosity, huh? So these chemicals and toxins are like the, they're, they're are the primary, right? they're likely the primary reason for obesity worldwide. Because again, Fat doesn't make you fat, okay? Fat is actually toxic storage dumps in the body. So when you consume toxins and your body can't get rid of them, it's a protective mechanism of the body to produce fat because fat binds toxins. So think about it like, you know, the big storage depots called fat, you know, and it's just like those big storage tanks. Is your body can't get rid of stuff efficiently because your detoxification pathways are not working right, then it's going to store it up, but it needs somewhere to push it away from your internal organs where it can cause damage. So what does it do? It puts in fat in order to push it out to the sides. That's why, that's why people get big around the hips, the butt, the belly in men. This is, this is uh, storage fat, basically. It's very different from chubby cheeks and everything else. When you see it around here and around here, that's, that's what it is. Okay, next one. Health food is too expensive for most people, right? Who's heard that? Who said that? Everybody. You know? <laughs> Everybody? Yeah. Uh, the only reason that health food is more expensive is because of government intervention, period. Right? The, it's, 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 so, in other words, it's not really a myth that health food is more expensive. The myth is why it's more expensive. It shouldn't be more expensive. In fact, you don't have to use all the chemicals to produce it and everything else. It's the intervention and the subsidizing that makes the other stuff cheaper. So we've got a distorted view of what expensive is. Um, I think we mentioned in one of the previous workshops that the, that food in 1920s or something like that, they used to, the average person used to spend something like 20 plus percent of their income on food. And now it's like less than 7% that the average American spends on their food. We, we spend a very small proportion of our income on food when it should actually be a, a larger portion if, if you uh, consider what we should be eating. We've just seen cheap food and it's distorted our view. Okay, exercise myths. Most people don't have time to exercise. Who's used that one? All right, lots of us, right? Most people don't have time to exercise. Th this is a total myth. The benefit from exercise actually comes more from neurological response than it does than the, from the activity itself. Okay, in other words, if you go and you, and you lift a pencil 2,000 times, your muscle isn't really going to get much bigger. Okay, you're, now the, the muscle that bends your elbow is probably going to get a little bit bigger, but you know, you're not going to get massive, you know, these giant arms all over the place because you're not creating a neurological response. However, if you go and you pick up a weight that's more than you can lift and you get that thing, I mean, you're just screaming to try and get that weight up, your muscle is going to respond a lot better because you, you cause your brain to have to react to that weight. So think about that in terms of cardiovascular fitness. If you go and you do a light, a light pace walk around the neighborhood, you're going to hear, you know, done five mile walks around the neighborhood, you know, it takes like two hours to do it. And it's like, I mean, it's a nice day, you're getting oxygen, I mean, it's good that you move, but in reality, you could go and sprint up and down the street a couple times and you'd get far more benefit. Your body will actually stimulate response a lot quicker. So uh, it's the neurological response, the above, down, inside, out, that makes the difference, not the activity itself. Burning calories is the way to lose weight, right? This is perpetual, we see, you know, most people still believe this today. This is, a, uh, of course, a myth also. Weight loss is more about toxicity, as I just talked about, than it is about calories because your body is not a closed environment. So the idea is here that when you, when you burn calories, you know, if you count your calories and you only consume so many calories, then you know how many you can burn. And even on the treadmills, it has on there, you know, the number of calories that you burn in that amount of time. And while that does calculate, it really doesn't matter. And you can prove that by, you know, we, we all know somebody 
that has worked out and worked out and worked out and worked out and they just don't lose they don't lose weight as fast or as much as the next guy who seems to hardly do anything and they lose tons of weight right how does that happen you know if they're eating the same amount of weight people can lose different amounts it's because the body is not a closed environment how much of your water of, of your body is made up of water roughly 75% very good yeah 70 plus percent is water so your skin absorbs water readily so that means you can absorb and eliminate water through the skin fairly simple fairly simple you know it's not a closed environment so the rules of thermodynamics that we use in, in physics they don't really apply to the human body that's why the calorie theory falls apart so it's really you know can your body burn those particular calories anyways you know what is a calorie how does it convert is it something your body can use as fuel Big muzzles mean you are healthy, right? No. Just because no. you have giant biceps. It's funny when you see uh, the the. <laughs> you guys stand up and do that. <laughs> I think everybody wanted to see that. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can't even look the power. <laughs> Raw power. <laughs> The, uh, you know, the epitome of this, the Spartan race, right? You know, you go out and you watch the, the Spartan race and you see these, or even like UFC, you know, you see the guys that come in and they just got, I mean, they're just chiseled out everywhere. But you see them and they are, I mean, oh man, that's funny in the Spartan race watching some of these beefcake guys. I mean, they are dying because they're carrying around all this muscle. They've got a lot of muscle, but they don't have cardiovascular fitness. Even if they do, they might have tumors growing on their spine. They don't have any idea. So the myth is that big muscles just mean big muscles. That's it. But that's not health. Health is determined by systemic health, not appearance. And balance of strength is always priority. It's how well balanced. Who, who, you know, what, what's the epitome really of strength? Gymnasts. Right? Yeah. Olympic gymnasts. You guys, you see those guys? Oh my goodness, I mean that just, that astounds me on every level, seeing how those guys, you know, are able to just hold themselves those up cars. between two rings, yeah. you know, and they don't have, they don't have massive, you know, muscles that are like, you know, the size of a quarter house, I mean it's just, it's, no, they look relatively small, thank you. <laughs> That is the best compliment I've gotten all week, <laughs> probably all year. <laughs> uh, so it's, you know, but, but the reason I go through this one, the reason this jumps into mind is I used to do screenings in gyms, right? And so you go to the gym, worst possible place you can go to talk pe to people about their health. Every single, I mean, they, they walk by, they got the towels, they're doing the monkey walk, you know, and, and, and you're, you're like, hey, I'm here to check your spine. <laughs> Who needs a spine? We got these. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're just, it's, it's like, people have this idea that it, as long as you work out, you're good, right? Yeah, that's all you need. You just need to work out. It's not true. Okay? I'm healthy because I exercise. You don't even have big muscles. It's just because I exercise, I'm healthy, right? Again, exercise can actually do harm if subluxation is affecting organ functions such as your heart. Right? Think about it. If you're out on the soccer field and you've got perfectly functioning neurological function going to your heart, everything's working exactly the way it's supposed to, you're probably going to be fine. But what happens, you know, the guy had a concussion the week before, wrenched his neck out sideways, it's putting pressure on the spinal cord, shutting down function of his heart to 63%. He goes out on the field and is running around. You guys have seen him. And they just collapse in the middle of the field and die there on the spot. Nobody knows why. Right? It's because of this factor. You've got to know. You've got to understand how the body functions. Function comes first when it's when we're talking about healthy or not. Not exercise. Exercise does a lot, but it's not the picture of health. Okay. Exercise just makes you tired. Somebody in here has used this one once or twice, right? So it just makes you tired. This is a myth. Demand in the world of your body. Demand equals supply. That's the economics of the body, and so long as function and resources are adequate, it's very, very efficient. Very efficient. 
your body is going to give you more energy than you can possibly burn. Mm -hmm. You just got to create the demand for it. The body will supply, right? You know, it's a it's a economic principle backwards. Supply demand. You know, if there's we'll we'll create the supply and create the demand for it. No, you you know your body will supply if you just create the demand. If everything is working functionally, again, if your thyroid's all jacked up, you know you know you're going to be tired no matter what you do. You're going to be tired, right? Or the opposite end, you're going to be hyperactive and jumping off of buildings, right? <laughs> um, this is the best kind of exercise. Who's here with that? This is the best kind of exercise ever. Yeah, I mean, we've all heard that. It's a myth. And anytime you hear that, immediate red flag. Every kind of movement has its benefit. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter that you can't do insanity. You're still going to be okay. You know, if all you can do is some deep knee bends, oh man, feel the burn, right? That's enough. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. You'll get to the insanity. You'll get to the other levels. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. That was, of course, not really an exercise. That was Martin Luther King. <laughs> but you get the point. It's, that's exactly true. Just do it, right? There's another one. Nike, just do it. It's just whatever you can do, keep moving. It's stagnation that causes decline. Stagnation is bad. Okay? Uh, medical miss. This is, this is the second most fun section. And there's tons of them here. <laughs> vaccines eradicated disease. Right? No. We are saved by vaccines. No! Myth. There is no valid, isolated proof. Now you can you can show valid proof a number of different ways, right? They use them all the time. The problem is they're not isolated. They're not counting out all the other factors that were involved. They're basically just taking a generic picture <coughs> and saying, "Oh, look, that's." I mean, here's the equivalent. Uh, Stephanie gets a better job. She gets a raise, you know, and she's she's making triple the income that you're making right now. Ooh. And I walk into my office tomorrow, and on the video, I'm, I'm parroting, see, chiropractic gets you better jobs. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that was all me. I mean, I adjust you, so that must have been the reason you got a better job. You, you know, I mean, that's the kind of science that's behind the <coughs> statistics that vaccinations are, are the cause of all of it. Are we still going? We're good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so... It's just simply not true. It is most likely sanitation and dietary changes that are responsible. You can see this over and over again if you look at the data, if you look at the statistics. In fact, you still see these problems in areas of the world where they have poor sanitation. Of course that's going to happen. You're going to have infectious disease if you're, if you're drinking poop water. Right? That's going to happen. But when we, when we get clean water to places, the infectious disease just obliterates in that area. It's obvious. Uh, we also saw it with hand washing. You know, when people started washing their hands, doing surgery and delivering babies, we saw much better results. So it's not just vaccinations that were behind this. In fact, uh, we, you know, if you really look at the data, it looks like they just rode the wave. It really has nothing to do with it. And especially the original vaccines like smallpox, they took pus out of the boils of the cows, straight out of the cows, and injected it into you. It's like, you know, sucking out an unhealthy cow. Okay, you ready? Come on, bend over. Yeah, who in the world would want to do that? And so people got massively sick, and it perpetuated smallpox, and then, you know, and, but they made enough money that they could now change the model and increase the, increase the uh, public education and change the dogma that was being perpetuated in the public. It's just been bad science for a century. So, while much of the information is available that vaccines have a long history of creating health disasters, that's just one of them. There's a book uh, by, by McBeal called um, the, uh, the Poison Needle that was written in like 1953. And it's just filled with all kinds of data and statistics. I mean, it sounds like it was written today, but it was written way back then, you know, in the 1950s about the smallpox vaccine. Excellent book. Um, all right, vaccines are safe and effective, right? You hear that still today, all the time. Vaccines are safe and effective. Okay, well, there is plenty of evidence widely available that vaccines are not safe nor effective. 
So this is purely propaganda. It's purely just, you know, saying a message that makes no sense. Chiropractic gives you better jobs. I mean, it's, it's obviously correct, right? <laughs> you know, who in here has gotten a better job since you've been a patient here? Come on, come on. Okay, <laughs> see? There's our proof. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the kind of science that we're talking about. So risk to benefit simply is not substantiated. When you look at the risks that are there, for example, the MIT study from, I think, 2011 that showed that it's the combination of aluminum and Tylenol uses that is the cause of autism, then the risk is just not substantiating the benefits that are highly questionable. So if the if the benefit cannot outweigh the wit, uh, it cannot outweigh the risks, then why would you do it? But we're just doing it because that's what we've always done. It's cutting the hands off the ham. Uh, <laughs> marijuana is bad for you. I, I figured I'd just throw this one in there. Uh, I thought you were going to say that. We had that before we came here. That's why I got the munchies. Uh, we had that discussion in Sun oh, what was it? Oh, a youth workshop one time. And they yeah. were like, but it's, it's of the earth. <laughs> it's like, yeah. this is good. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. But you now, said marijuana was bad. For, for the record. I've never smoked marijuana, and I can I can say that with an with an open face. I've I've never smoked marijuana before, but it's absolutely ridiculous that it's illegal. Now, is it bad to do with a child in the room? Yes. Why? Because it's illegal. Right. Yeah. Rather rather it's good for you or not, it's still bad to do because it's illegal. You will still will go to jail. Right. Now, but that's not the question. The question is, is marijuana bad for you? Uh, who knows anyone who has died from marijuana? Anybody? I've asked that question hundreds of times just since, you know, so, well, honestly, since I watched the movie, uh, the first one we watched it on Netflix, it was um, Super High Me. And that was that was a movie that, like, I watched it, I'm like, oh my gosh, I never thought about this before. You know, I, mean, cause I don't smoke dope, so I really <laughs> wouldn't think to. Uh, but I don't know anybody that's ever died from marijuana usage, yet I know people that have died from alcohol. I know tons of people that have died from medications. I know people that have gone out drinking and then took a Tylenol, one Tylenol, and died from the combination of them. Yet you can buy those things. Why is marijuana illegal? Yeah, I, say from tobacco industry. Yeah, that's probably a big part of it. I think pharmaceutical interests have a lot to do with it. You know, because it's it is known now to be an effective painkiller. It's known now to have benefits for cancer. And that's why they're starting to turn it over and they're starting to try to push to make it legal. I, I, it's just it's just kind of ridiculous because there are a lot of benefits to it and I don't see a lot of side effects, you know, other than you drive slow, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, I mean, people will say it's a gateway drug, you know, and I'm like, I, I'm sorry, ADHD medications are gateway, gateway drugs. drugs. Yes, they are. Much more than marijuana is. Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting Alcohol. kids hooked on this stuff from, from childhood. Alcohol. I don't know too many no, four-year-old kids. Sort of, um, they put something in cigarettes and it make them more addictive than what they were. Yeah. Oh, I'm not surprised. Uh, well, they put, um, they put uh, fiberglass in them in a dip to make it cut the inside of your mouth so the tobacco goes in faster. Oh, you get a quicker hit. Wow. Yeah. Fiberglass. That's so gross. Okay, so we'll move on past marijuana. Uh, <laughs> cholesterol is bad, right? That's what they Everybody's say. heard this. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol is bad. You should know your cholesterol number. Um, I read a really interesting article. You guys need to get on my uh, Facebook page and look for the article that I just posted about cholesterol, uh, about cholesterol drugs, because they're changing the guidelines to the cholesterol drugs, and the pharmaceutical companies are panicking. Because they've spent all these billions of dollars getting ready to produce the next line of drugs, and the um, the doctors, the cardio, the cardiology association, whatever it is, they came out with a new guideline saying that get this, you have to actually prove a benefit to the heart in order to get passage of a new drug. Like, I mean, really? 
Why is that only now coming out? <laughs> and so, so the, the article literally said that the age of getting drugs passed because they change lab values are over. This is what we've been saying for 10 years. Like, you can take a drug and yes, yes, I get it, it lowered your cholesterol number. That's not the question. The question is, does it translate to real world reduction of risk? No. The research says no. If you're a woman of any age, no. If you haven't had a previous heart attack, no. So, why are you taking it? Because the number looks good on a piece of paper and I'm scared not to, right? That's what it comes down to. So, the myth is cholesterol is your body's spackle. If you go and you damage a wall, you chop a hole in the wall, you've got to go back with spackle and fill that in. Spackle, therefore, is a good thing, right? right. If you didn't have it, you'd have a big ugly hole in the wall. So, if you did not have cholesterol in your body, you would have a lot of damage in your arteries that go unrepaired. And this causes bigger problems and this leads to heart attack and stroke. The spackle in your body just happens to be associated with heart disease. So uh, there, there's another good video that's um, online, it's on, my, on the website on one of them that we've done before. And uh, it shows basically just a little spoof video and they, in, the, in the video they associate the problem with the cause of car accidents as being skid marks. You know, so skid marks are the cause of auto accidents. You guys seen that? Some of you have. And obviously it's not, but they saw such a strong association of skid marks with car accidents that they figured that must be the cause. Right? It's so ridiculous, but that's exactly what we're talking about with cholesterol. It's associated, but it is not the cause. The problem is why your cholesterol increases. It's the damage that's being done to your arteries. It's things like leaky gut syndrome, toxins. That's the big problem. It's the stress being put on your, on your system. Uh, blood pressure is normal at 120 over 80. This isn't a myth all the time, right? I mean, it's, it's true some of the time, but it's wrong most of the time. Okay, so blood pressure is normal, get this, at exactly where it is. So everybody in here right now, wherever it is, unless you're taking medication, if you're taking medication, it's not where it's supposed to be. Think about that for a second. If you're on medication, it's not where it's supposed to be. If you're not taking medication, then your blood pressure is exactly where it's supposed to be. Why? Because your brain put it there. Your brain put it there intelligently. So if, if I'm standing here and I'm doing whatever, and then all of a sudden I go flying across the room and run laps around you guys, what's going to happen? Hopefully, unless I'm taking blood pressure medication, then I'm going to pass out and smash my face on the ground, <laughs> right? Because my blood pressure doesn't catch up, but it should go up to keep the pressure, keep the blood going to my brain and spinal cord while my muscles are consuming it. It's supposed to happen that way. So you can see just on that idea right there, blood pressure medications are very dangerous because they actually, they limit your body's ability to push oxygen and it's giving you a false reality. So uh, we're now finding in the research that blood pressure medications are cancer fertilizer because they starve your body of oxygen. So, so would that, that, wouldn't that cause you to have heart problems and other things if it's not pumping absolutely. properly? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, people, people end up having, you know, people end up having strokes and heart attacks and everything still, even though they're taking blood pressure medications. Uh, they take blood pressure medications, you know, and then, and they stay on them for a while, and then at some point their kidneys fail. You know, because it never really got fixed. They just kept on putting patches over it. So we're not really fixing a problem when we're, when we're taking blood pressure pills. Uh, Okay, so you've got to look at why the body has it there and fix that. That's really the big, the big idea. Okay, you get sick by catching it from others. Oh, goodness. Careful, anybody sick in here? Oh. Right? Cold. Uh, so, you know, don't, don't you dare cough any. I mean, think about it. Anybody knows this. If you're sitting at the, you've all, you all got families, you've been sitting around and one person is sick, but the rest of you don't immediately get sick. You know, and usually, in most cases, none of you, you know, get sick. You know, one person got sick for a while, and then they're better, and all is okay. It's not because everybody else went in and got their flu shot. 
So the, this is an absolute myth. Under normal daily circumstances, your body's resistance through immune function is much more important than mere exposure. It's your internal resistance that matters. When do most people get sick? When they run themselves down. When they run their resistance down. They get sick during flu season. Why is flu season when flu season is? Vitamin D. Lack of exercise. It gets cold outside. People stop exercising. They stop being outside. They stop getting vitamin D. So their immune system crashes. Everybody gets sick. Their body readjusts. And they get well again. Wow. You know, it's not because everybody missed their flu shot. Right? This is natural transition. Why do you see more sickness in cold environments than you do around the equator? Why do you see less? I mean, I wonder how the, how the yearly flu is in the middle of Africa. Right? I mean, I doubt they have that many problems with it. So it's worse. We can see it worse, definitely, in the, <coughs> in the colder environments. So I love this. Uh, B.J. Palmer said, if the germ theory were true, there'd be nobody left to believe it. <laughs> right? <laughs> there'd be nobody left to believe it. We'd all be dead a long time ago. I was telling somebody this the other day because uh, I can't remember how it came up. But um, I was saying if you were to open up your body right now, you, you, know, you were to just basically somebody reach in and grab a ladle full of you know stuff in your gut you know and you took a blood sample and you know on a stool sample you know you did an enema all this stuff you just pull all this stuff out of your system you would find all kinds of stuff you would find E. coli you would find salmonella you would find probably some venereal diseases you'd find all kinds of stuff I mean you would find some crazy stuff that you'd be like how in the world do I have these things and it's because you're carrying them around all the time. It doesn't matter that you're exposed to them. Your body does perfectly fine with them. It's simply that your resistance is strong enough to deal with it. So you don't have an issue. How many people in here have, um, uh, <laughs> how many people in here have, uh, have uh, cold sores, fever blisters? I mean, you probably don't want to. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, most, a lot of people, they get, they get cold sores. But do you get them all the time? No. no. Okay, what do we know about cold sores? They only pop up once in a while, and we know that it's a dormant virus that stays in your nerves, and then it pops up here and there. We still good? If, it, if it's going to go down, let me know, and I'll have you switch over to my it's phone. It's 10%. Okay. Oh, we should be fine. Um, so, basically, that virus is there all the time. It's just when you trigger it by stress that it ends up popping up, right? So it's there all the time. It's your internal resistance that matters. See how that works? So that's what we should be focusing on. That's what we should be paying attention to. Build your resistance. Right? That's the whole idea of health. All right. Antibiotics are your best bet if you get sick. You would definitely think so if you walk into any medical clinic where they hand out antibiotics like candy. Most illnesses are viral in which antibiotics have how much use? Zero. They don't do anything for viruses. This drives me nuts because I still have patients come in all the time and say, you know, I went to the doctor because I was sick and, you know, I just, I had to go back to work. You know, and some of you guys might have said this to me. Yes, I got irritated. Uh, uh, you know, and, and I took an antibiotic and I said, great, what kind, you know, what did the culture come back positive for? Oh, they didn't do a culture. Okay, so what do you have? Well, I don't know. It's probably, they said it was probably a virus. You know, and I'm just beating my head up, up against a wall. Like, you did nothing. Not only did you not do anything, but you actually destroyed your immune system through gut decimation. You, you set off a nuclear warhead inside of your gut, destroying all your probiotics. Now you have no immune system left to fight off anything else that comes through the pipe. So what's going to happen? Two months down the road, you're going to be working on building up that, that internal gut balance again, but because it's not healthy, it's not in balance, something else is going to come along and you're going to get sick again. And then you've got to go back on antibiotics. Has anybody in here ever been on a cycle of antibiotic use over a long period of time? But definitely I have. When, I mean, I grew up like that. Like every couple of months I was back on antibiotics. 
just, oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, he's got another ear infection. Oh, another sinus infection. You know, yeah, how many in here have grandkids that you see that happen to? Yeah, I see rolling eyes, right? All the time. So, Jayla, did you ever deal with that? No? Because you never gave me an antibiotic. Yeah. What, what's it like to be sick? Um, not, not so bad, but... Exactly, you don't know. <laughs> that's, that's, that was my point. You've never really been sick, so... I've gotten snide nose and cold. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, never, like, never, like, virus. Who, who in here would like to grow up, have grown up like that? Like, yeah, sign me up. Okay, depression, ADHD, etc. are caused by chemical imbalance. Y'all heard that before, right? Yes. All over and over and over. Okay, here's the myth. The monoamine hypothesis, as this is called, the chemical imbalance hypothesis, was created by Joseph uh, Schildkraut in 1965, despite never being scientifically proven to this day. It's never been proven to this day. Where did I get this information? Wikipedia. Like, I mean, this is, this is widely known information. This was made up. But why did it stick? Because it was sticky. That's it. Because it was sticky. Because the doctor said, oh, wow, that actually sounds good. That's believable. People will believe that. So they started using that to sell drugs. And to this day, people still say that these things are caused by chemical imbalance. It's not true. You don't have a chemical imbalance. Your kids do not have a chemical imbalance until they start taking the medications. Because the medications do absolutely cause chemical imbalances. So this is the backbone of the, of the psychiatric industry, and it's been that way for over 50 years, despite never being proven true. That's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, this is this is absolutely absurd. This makes me madder than just about anything in healthcare, especially because of how many kids are taking antidepressants and ADHD medications. Okay, root canals and amalgam fillings are perfectly safe. Probably some of you in here have root canals, right? Okay, recent study that just came out a couple weeks ago: root canals linked to 97% of fatal cancers. They found that patients that die from cancer. 97% of them had root canals. That is stunning. I mean, I, I mean that, that would be one thing if, if it was 97% of people that die from cancer have hair. Right? I mean, because like everybody has hair. Well, not everybody. You know, but most people have hair. So that wouldn't be that shocking. But, I mean, most people, don't have, I'm, I'm just curious in this room if I can ask how many people have root canals. Okay. So it's less than half, right? So less than half of the room has root canals, yet we know now that one out of two people, I think it is, one out of two people die from cancer, right? But many more people have cancer, you know, but a lot of them live. But 97% of fatal cancers have root canals. That's stunning. Until you understand how root canals work. You know, and, and the fact that you're leaving dead tissue inside your mouth that harbors bacteria and constantly poisons you on a repetitive cycle. So my, my suggestion, if you have root canals, see a biological dentist and see about getting them removed. Getting them, yes, that means getting pulled and replaced with a bridge or something like that. Uh, amalgams also, they've been discontinued around the world due to known health risks. I mean, this... Five years ago, ten years ago, we'd have to argue about this point, but now it's like, just look around the world. You know, don't look in the U.S., we're slow. Now that, that's what we are in the U.S., we're slow on everything when it comes to health. But around the world, they ban them from use. They don't use them anymore because they know the, the health risk. Look up the video of the smoking tooth online. Uh, fluoride makes your teeth strong, right? How many in here have fluoride in your toothpaste? Go home and look. If you have fluoride in your toothpaste, get rid of it. It is being systematically removed from use around the world as research conclusively shows it causes fluoridation. It doesn't protect your teeth. It actually makes them chalky and brittle and gives you spots on your teeth that now become susceptible to more, uh, more cavities. Okay, but more than that, it causes pineal gland calcification. The pineal gland is that little teeny gland in the middle of your brain. It's the only gland in the body that you have one of. And it causes calcification. They look at x-rays and they see that it's calcified. It's no longer usable. 
This is in cultures around the world known as the third eye. It's basically we have no idea what the function of the pineal gland is really to this day, but it has weird functions that, that help perception and a lot of just strange neurological stuff. Probably why it's dead center in the middle of the brain. I, I expect it's pretty important, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty well More protected. More important than the brain. Okay. I don't know about that. I don't know about that. <laughs> you couldn't live with either. Uh, it blocks. It also blocks iodine absorption. How many people are deficient in iodine? Pretty much everybody in the U.S. in most civilized nations. Okay, so uh, most disease is genetic. How many in here have been told that disease is genetic by a doctor in your past? Yeah, absolutely. This is an absolute myth. Most disease is caused by epigenetics, which means above the genes. Epigenetics is the new field of research that shows that, that guy Bruce Lipton that's been on our videos for like the last 20,000 weeks, um, <laughs> eventually it's going to be done, I promise. Uh, it's a really long seminar. Uh, but uh, astounding stuff in that video. Epigenetics is a field that shows that your lifestyle activates, triggers genes turning on and turning off. So you can have a particular genetic pattern and sequence but if you don't do bad things to trigger the bad genes, they'll never turn on. They'll never affect you. But if you do dumb things, you'll activate those genes and end up developing cancer as a, as a result of it. Right? So is it smart to go and get a double vasectomy because you have a certain genetic phenotype? No. no. Yeah. You're, you're doing things preemptively, but genes don't really mean that much. It's only about 3%. Uh, so therefore, lifestyle, not medicine, is the most effective means of healthy longevity, period. It's not your genes. You can take people from one genetic group, move them into the United States, for example, Okinawa, you take Okinawans, you move them out of Okinawa, you plant them smack dab in the middle of the United States, they're going to die just as fast as anybody else. You take Americans out, and you plant them in Okinawa, and they're going to live longer, just like the people there. And it's not geography, it's a lifestyle. It kind of goes with the geography, but... Okay, she, he or she got cancer. This one really bothers me. You guys have all heard this. They got cancer, right? Okay, this is a myth. You don't get cancer. You develop it. There's a big difference in there, and there's, there's a major neurological thing that's going on there with that idea that you get it. That implies that it's a foreign invader, an outside invader, is it, it, that that's coming into your body. So this idea that cancer is an outside invader is the reason why usual treatments sound sane, right? So think about it. You you know we're in this room and uh, you know we're we're doing a workshop and all of a sudden a terrorist comes running in the building, right? And is strat you know has has guns blazing, right? And so I happen to be standing here with a hand grenade, and so I toss the hand grenade over by the terrorist. And it blows up. You know, some of us do okay, some of us don't do okay, but as long as we got the terrorists, we're all good. I mean, it sounds sane. Until we realize, you know, that there really is no terrorist, right? It's we develop cancer. How do we develop cancer? It would be basically like this. Like all of us are doing the workshop, and we all start picking on rum. <laughs> right? We start picking on Ron and we start pushing him and teasing him and you know and everything else and finally he gets sick of us and starts pulling on guns, right? That's basically more sane. That's the picture of cancer. You see the difference? So we've got to change what we're doing. We've got to change the internal environment so that we're not fostering the development of cancer. Not treating it like it's an outside invader that we've got to uh, burn, cut, radiate, poison, because we're doing those things to ourselves, and we're actually making the problem worse. Okay. Okay. The FDA protects the public. Right. No. No. The FDA really just simply follow the money. The FDA protects those who feed it. Where does the money come from that goes to the FDA? Pharmaceuticals. Who are they going to protect? They're not going to go against the pharmaceuticals. Look at the case of uh, Stanislav Berzinski. Right now, that's going on right now. The guy's got a bona fide cancer cure, and he's battling the FDA. Has been for the last like 15 years, trying to raise millions of dollars to go through clinical trials to get his cure on the market. 
while he's constantly being sued and trying to be shut down by the same FDA. <laughs> you know, so the idea is they're trying to shut him out because he's a threat to the pharmaceutical industry. So they protect themselves. It's that simple. Uh, modern medicine is scientific, right? I mean, look at the machines. Look at the hospitals, right? I mean, you work in it. It's amazing. I mean, the technology is quite amazing. Yeah. It looks yeah. good. Mm -hmm. It looks fancy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's... Uh, but in reality, it's kind of like... You, you guys seen that guy that drives down the street and he's got the totally pimped out car. Everything looks all neat and everything until you realize it's a Honda Civic. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like... It's, it, you know, and anybody that, that... You know, the guys that do the show Top Gear are like, dude... It's a Honda Civic. Like, I mean, they know it for what it really is, right? There, it's it's no Lamborghini, it's no Ferrari, it's just a uh, Civic. So that's kind of like modern medicine. That's the way I look at it. It's like it looks really flashy on the outside. It looks good, but at the at, on the inside, it's got a puny engine. So Okay, so it's immobility that causes arthritis. So, of course, when your spine stops moving, that's when your spine starts degenerating. So when you lose proper motion, that's when it starts. It's not motion itself. Motion, actually, it, it lubricates the spine. It gets moisture and, and oxygen into the spine. It doesn't cause the opposite. Okay? Uh, degeneration is normal aging, right? You know, you're, oh, it's just because you're old, right? You know, we've heard this part, too. That is not true. Research shows your spine is designed to last 120 years without degeneration. So it's not supposed to lose its function. Uh, hyaline cartilage, incredibly efficient. If we could build car engines that were as efficient in their lubrication as hyaline cartilage, which is in like your knees and your elbows and your fingers, our engines would last forever. They would last your entire lifetime. Like you could, you could probably drive your car your whole life, then pass it down to your kids and your grandkids, and it would keep it would keep on going. I mean, it is incredible how efficient the, uh, the lubrication in the body is. So it is not degeneration, or it, I'm sorry, it's not aging that's causing it. It's lifestyle that's causing it. It's injury that causes it. It's, it's dysfunction that's causing it. Okay? Uh, once you start chiropractic, you will always have to. Who's heard that from a friend? Right? Yeah. Uh, just think about that. I mean, that, that makes no sense at all. Like, you can quit anytime you want to, really. I mean, if you guys just said, oh, that's it, I'm done. If any of you thought that you were locked into your care plan and that's the only reason you're here, you, you can actually go and tell them and they'll cancel you tonight, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a ridiculous notion. This makes sense only to someone who doesn't understand why you get adjusted. So, uh, obviously, you can quit anytime you want to, but the question is, why would you want to? So, see, their problem is they're thinking, well, the reason you get adjusted is because you're in pain. And so you're going to have to get adjusted the rest of your life because, you know, once you start getting adjusted, you get used to it, and that becomes your crutch to keep you out of pain. And then you stop getting adjusted, and you go back in pain. And, I mean, even on that, it's like, well, wait a minute. But you were in pain before you started chiropractic. So why would you think you'd get better without it? Right? I mean, it's just, on every level, the argument falls apart and it's completely ridiculous. So I wonder where it came from. <laughs> you know? It probably came from somebody that just had an agenda to get people to not start chiropractic. So it made sense, kind of like you have a chemical imbalance in your brain. They should actually use that one. You know, you're, oh, you're going to go to a chiropractor, you have a chemical imbalance in your brain. <laughs> right? <laughs> you are not wise and and you're, you're chemically imbalanced, so we're going to put you in an insane asylum so that you don't go to the chiropractor. Okay, so uh, when I'm fixed, I won't have pain anymore. I'm sure some of you have had this idea, okay? This, this one is actually one of my favorite uh, topics to talk about because think about this for a second. When I'm fixed, I won't have pain anymore. It seems to make, it seems to make sense. Even right now, some of you are like, well, 
Yeah, I thought so. That's why I'm here, right? Okay, think about it. This is more bad pain programming. Pain programming. We've been programmed to think that pain is the problem. And so we're going to have a really hard time being on the same page as long as you think pain is the problem. Right? I mean, if you've been here for a while, you know, if you've been under care for a couple of years or so, you know that I don't really talk about pain a whole lot. Right? You know that we, you might start talking about pain and I'm like looking at birds. Right? <laughs> and it's, it's because of this idea. I know it's bad pain programming coming back into action. See, when you're in good function, you know earlier when there is a problem as you are more sensitive to it. Right? So, so in other words, take a person who has never seen a chiropractor and says, Oh, I never had back pain in my life. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> right? He might still have subluxation. Bingo. He doesn't you, know it. Exactly. <laughs> there, that, that's, that's exactly correct. It's, you're, you, know, you have so much subluxation in your system, you're so messed up and dysfunctional, you don't have a clue that you're dysfunctional. It's like the husband who is a complete jerk and thinks he's perfectly fine even though his wife is talking to everybody about how much a jerk he is, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's just this massive level of dysfunction. And so, I would much rather be in a status of good function and feel it the minute that I know something is out. I mean, how many times have you guys heard a story where somebody goes to the doctor and they find a tumor in their body the size of a basketball? And they had no idea it was there. Do you see the problem there? Because, I mean, number one, a guy like me, I'd better know that I have a basketball inside of me. Right? I mean, I, I, so, so we have problem number one. You're so large that you can't see a basketball. Right? You have, you have so much in one area that you, do, you don't see it. That's a problem. But the bigger problem is that there's such a loss of function that you don't feel it. I mean, I want to know if my neck is out a little bit. I want to know it. And see, I've been getting adjusted for like 10 years now, so I know the minute that I'm out, I can feel that little bit out. I, I can tell you exactly where I need to be adjusted. In fact, some of you guys are getting to this level, right? That you've been here long enough that, Lisa, right? You know, you're, you're on the table, and I, I love it. I, I actually do when you get to that point because it makes my job really easy to where, you know, you lay down, we adjust, and I'm like, you clear? No, I'm still out right there. Right? Has anybody in here done that? Yeah. See, that's good to know that. You know where your dysfunctions are. You know where to fix it. What, so, so in this statement, when I'm fixed, I won't have pain anymore. So what you're really saying is you want to be so disconnected from your body that you don't know when there's a problem. You see that? So the idea that you're never going to have pain anymore, don't even go there because... I'm going to make you more sensitive to problems. That's it. Think about it from a church standpoint. You go to church so that you're more sensitive of the other, you know, the other way of living, right? Yeah. You know, oh, it, it, wait, you mean that's a problem? Right? You know, it's you want to be more sensitive. You want to raise your level of awareness because then you know when to see it, identify it, and fight it. Right? So we've that, that's probably one of my favorite topics of the whole night tonight, if you can't tell. Because most of you guys believe this before we talked about it. Okay, the pop is what makes the adjustment work. Right? Oh, man, it didn't pop. Ugh. Right? <laughs> is that why you haven't been here in a while? <laughs> the pop is what makes the adjustment work. Okay, a lot of it, a lot of times people are like, "Oh man, it didn't pop. I really thought it was going to pop." The pop isn't isn't necessary. It's not necessary. The the adjustment is simply a neurological reconfiguration. That's all it is. Think about it. The word adjustment means adjustment. It's just it means a motion, a movement, a slight hand, uh, you know, a, a slight motion. That's all it is. So if I if I push on the table, you know, the table moved. 
I don't have to kick the table over and make it smash through the wall. <laughs> right? So, but that little movement bought might be enough that the cleaning lady doesn't come by and bust her, ta her toe on the table. Right? You see the point? It's just an adjustment. But your body only needs small adjustments to move in the right direction. It wants to go in a direction. It wants to get better. So what happens, you make the adjustment and it's just enough to put energy into that system that it starts to reconfigure on its own. Does that make sense? That's why you can have chiropractic techniques that don't seem to do a whole lot. You know, they, that some of them don't even put their hands on you. You know, but it, it actually does show benefits because it's an adjustment, not a re, you know, we're not molding you like Gumby. Okay? <laughs> it beeps. Pops? I, I heard it beep. Is it still good? Okay. Pops, uh, though usually happen, are not always required for change. Okay, so that's the bottom line. They're not always required for change. Uh, a classic example of this, I've had patients in the past with scoliosis. One lady, she, for the, a year and a half under care, never had one single audible pop. Yet in that time, we reduced her scoliosis by like 12 degrees. How's that happen? You know, how many times have you guys felt a movement in your spine when I adjust you, yet I didn't feel it move? Right? I'm making the movement, and I'm, you know, and I didn't feel it move, but you're like, oh, yeah, it moved. I'm like, oh, great. Sounds good. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, it doesn't always make loud noises. Babies are too young to need chiropractic, right? You guys heard this? They don't want to get their kids adjusted because they're, you know, they shouldn't need it. Okay, research shows over 85% of children suffer birth trauma to their cervical spines. So how many kids at least need chiropractic? 85%. So you probably need to see all of them to catch the 85%. Because I don't want my kid to be the 15%. You know, or I don't want to be, my, my kid is part of the 15% that doesn't get checked when in reality they have a problem. Okay, uh, there is no evidence of harm to children in the research. There's no, nobody's ever, in a hundred years of chiropractic, they've never shown any research to show that it's harmful to kids. We can't say it's safe for vaccinations, yet vaccinations are standard protocol, right? So, there's no evidence to show harm. And how much dysfunction is acceptable for your children? Are you willing to let your kids only function at 80% growing up? No. So, I mean, there's just, when you look at this from all kinds of different angles, a child is never too young to get adjusted. Now, let's look at the other end. Elderly people are too fragile to be adjusted. I have a patient right now, uh, Mr. Keith actually just lost his throne. I told him here a couple weeks ago. I just started a patient that's 93. Keith, how, how old are you? 88. 88. Mm -hmm. Rock on, right? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that, I mean, that's awesome. Uh, but he just lost his throne. She's 93. So she's got, she's got a few years on him. And she was told by her doctor, no, you can't go to a chiropractor. That's not a good idea. And, the, and uh, her daughter was like, no, I really think that she needs to go. This was after a car accident. So, I mean, just think about that. She was in a car accident. Survive that. <laughs> Yet he said, don't go to a chiropractor, because we're worse than a car accident, apparently. <laughs> I mean, so how little do they know about chiropractic? Nothing. They know nothing about what we do. So are you too fragile to be adjusted? No, elderly people are only too fragile to adjust more than is necessary. Right? I mean, of course, if I wanted to, I could probably break a lot of necks in here. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you only have to do enough to move the bone. That's it. And and the bones are still only that small. I mean, they're they're not that big. It doesn't take a lot of effort. So you can over adjust anybody. You know, you can over adjust babies too. All right. Uh, your body will tell you when it's time to get adjusted. Right. You know. So I'm. How many? You guys all know somebody like this. We have patients like this. They only come and get adjusted when they hurt. And they're like. You know, especially people who have transferred here from other chiropractors, this is almost always what we hear. So they come here from, oh, well, my last chiropractor, how often are you seeing them? Oh, I, you know, every four months, six months, maybe once a year, you know. Oh, but, you know, I knew when I needed to be adjusted. You know, I'd start getting, I, my, my back would lock up and freeze up again, and I couldn't feel my leg. You know, and then, and then I'd go back into the chiropractor, he'd pop me a few times, and oh man, 
I'm back at 100%. Right? I, I mean, you guys have all heard that. Think about that. How ridiculous is that? How ridiculous is that? The, the reality is, by the time you feel, you are already way behind. Why do you think your back slipped out so bad that it cut off your leg in the first place? <laughs> you had to have some massive dysfunction there in order for that to occur. You know, if you're healthy, that's not going to happen. So research shows 40% loss of function before symptoms show. Do you want to wait for the symptoms to show? Do you want to lose 40% function before you get adjusted? So the idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the chiropractor when I feel it, that stinks. I mean, that means you're already way behind the ball. I'd rather practice maintenance, right? I'd rather keep my body on top than wait for it to hurt. You know, I mean, I could probably make it six months, but I know that's not good, right? Uh, chiropractic is, is expensive. This is, this is another one some of you might still believe, right? I know this uh, answer. Chiropractic is <laughs> expensive. Because your health is more expensive than your you can just sit down now. Yeah, yeah. Good, good job. I'll, I'll, I'll give you your tip later. Uh, this is only a this is a myth. This is only a perception, right? It's only a perception. I'll give you an example. You know, somebody pulls up into the this hasn't happened yet, but you know, a guy pulls up into the into the uh, outside here driving a uh, you know a Ferrari Enzo, you know that he bought for a million dollars. Does he think his chiropractic care that costs a hundred bucks a month? Do you think that's expensive for him? No. No. So his perception is different, right? So it's everybody's perception. But but let's think about this. In reality, you know, compare the cost of healthcare. In other words, the the cost of maintaining your body to the cost of living in your house. Is it expensive? Not really. I mean, your house, I guarantee, most of you, I guarantee your house note is way more expensive than your chiropractor, right? Yeah. No, unless you own your house. Uh, what about your car, right? What about your kids? Kids are too expensive. I will guarantee, you know, I can vouch for that. Kids are too expensive. I'm sorry, Jaylen, you, you guys are too expensive. <laughs> what? I'm going to, I'm going to cut you off. <laughs> right? If, if I was, if someone, if you were going to sell me, I would be... Oh, a trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you see, that obviously we don't have the perception that kids are too expensive. So it's all about perception. It's all about perception. So what is undeniably expensive, though, is disease. Steve Jobs would agree with that, right? If he were still alive, he would agree with that, that disease is too expensive. He had all the money in the world, yet he could not stop that. So we've got to change our perception on that one, that chiropractic is expensive. I mean, it really, in, in economical terms for most people, it, it really does not make up a large percentage of our budgets. We probably spend just as much taking our families out to eat one night of the month. Uh, insurance doesn't cover chiropractic because it's not scientific. A lot of people still have this perception today. Here's the truth. There's a couple points. Number one, insurance is supposed to be for emergency. Number one. Right? Insurance was insurance in no other industry. Does your car insurance pay for oil changes? No. no. Does your home insurance pay for a new roof? No. No, not unless it gets hit by a hurricane first. Right? Or a meteor. Uh, so why does health insurance pay for you to smoke and drink and eat fast food? It doesn't make any sense. That's because the insurance industry is messed up. It's all about public interest. It's all about, it's all about taking money out of your pocket and in the, under the guise that you're being protected. But we've been duped into thinking that it's what it is not. It's supposed to be insurance. It's not insurance. You bought a membership, basically. You, have a, you bought a medical membership. Congratulations, you bought a membership for the Vaccine Club of America. You bought a membership for uh, all you can use uh, hospital buffet. That's really what insurance is now, health insurance. Number two, insurance companies are part of the pharma system. It's as simple as that. They're owned by the pharmaceutical industry. Why don't they pay for chiropractic? They don't want to. I mean, it's that easy. They don't want to. Does it make dollars to them, uh, dollar-wise sense? 
Yes, it does. We are proven in the Medicare system, they've done studies, they show that chiropractic care reduces medical, pe medical payments, medical spending. Some cases, like 40% or more. I mean, we cut medication use by like 80%, hospital visits by 90%, I mean, just outrageous numbers. So, you know, it's, it's not because of the dollar savings, it's because they don't want to pay for it. Uh, number three, there is plenty of scientific validity to chiropractic. I've got a ton of it on my website, and the reason it's covered is because of lawsuits won based on that research, based on that science. We've been able to fight and claw our way through courts to force them to pay for care. But in doing that, they say, okay, well, we'll pay for it, but you get 12 visits a year. That should be enough, right? You know, they're just going to give you... Uh, you know, just the smallest amount they possibly can by law. So, and that's, you know, they're fighting that all the time. They do not want to pay for it, period. Okay, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, this is the closing thought, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. That's Mark Twain. So the idea for tonight, you know, I, I want to I show, you know, a lot of the common perceptions that everybody still holds on to that hopefully you learned some of these things tonight that you didn't already know. Uh, but the big idea is this. Question everything. Question everything that you've ever learned. Why? Because if you've learned it, there's a reason why you learned it. Somebody wanted you to know it. Somebody wanted you to believe it. Was it usually for your benefit? No. In most cases, it was for their benefit. Right? So question everything. Two things are going to happen. A, you're going to find out it was wrong. And you're going to save yourself some headache. Right? That's, that's one option. B, you're going to find proof that's going to make it solid in your mind. To where now, when somebody else comes along and starts chatting at you, like the lady in the store saying, you know, GMOs are salvation, I'm going to know the research to be able to knock that down. Right? You know, so that's the only two possibilities that can happen. But if you just believe it because somebody told you that this is the way it is, and you're, and honestly, we're too lazy to look it up, to research it, to know it, then, of course, we're going to be questioning everything. You know, we're going to be sitting back wondering, well, are we right? Are we wrong? I don't know. You know, we, we end up in fear and everything else, you know, because we don't really know why we believe that way. It's uncertainty. So question everything because it's only going to make you more certain one way or the other. But you will gain your certainty in doing so.